Seating Table 112 with Dylan Leong. Welcome to the chaos. Yo, what up, everybody? Welcome back to the chaos. Today, we have on a very good friend of the show and the owner of the local watering hole for everybody in the L.A. nightlife scene, because if you've been in the L.A. nightlife scene, you definitely have a story about the Belmont. Ladies and gentlemen, our good friend Dylan. What's up, Dylan? Hey, how you doing? Thank you. That was a very flattering intro. I appreciate that, Mike. <laughs> yes, we welcome to the here. show, man. I'm excited because I've only seen you in passing in drunken moments. <laughs> so to get to know I'm you. I'm sorry for being that hammered at that time. I, I, I thank you for being that. I mean, D Dylan's like a legend and a staple. Oh, come on, in the LA night in the LA nightlife scene. I mean, who doesn't know the Belmont? You exactly. go down La Cienega all the time, and there it is. Yeah, like he, I said, it's always packed. It's the local watering hole. Like when we used to work at Greystone on Sundays, we would stop into the Belmont and have a drink before we went into work. Right, it was part of the ritual. Yeah, and then we would get cut. If I would get cut from fucking Greystone, I'd be like, "All right, I'm not going home. I'm just gonna go back to the Belmont because it's karaoke on Sundays." And right. Belmont's also the place where if you go to karaoke on Sundays, it's your typical L.A. karaoke. I'm not going to get up and sing karaoke because there's like amazing singers who sing karaoke. Wait, yeah, let's can, can you explain the, the karaoke at Belmont? Because when I went there, I was going to do a song and then I heard some people singing. I was like, nope, scratch me off. <laughs> um, you know, Belmont has, has uh, a long, long time ago in like the mid 2000s before I ever owned it. Uh, they started a karaoke promotion on Sunday nights. And uh, actually, it was a friend of mine who uh, I worked at Saddle Ranch with in like the early 2000s, Rob Evers, who started this promotion. And it just blew up to a point where at some point it was like a lot of celebrities were just showing up at this random bar on La Cienega and singing, you know, karaoke. And yeah, I mean, we, you know, LA has a lot of unused talent, you know, All over. or un un unrecognized or uh, unsuccessful talent, you know. And we just have a lot of people that come through, and they, they have been traditionally like very talented. I mean, we've had some horrendous singers, as all karaoke places do. But um, I think the good outweighs the bad, though. Like when I went, sometimes everybody's sometimes. like, what the fuck? Depends like, on the night, brother. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, th th there's the really, really good, the really bad. Or then, like, when me and Dylan get up to do a duo of, like, Footloose, because it's the sure. easiest song to sing. <laughs> Which is my song. Yeah. For and, sure. And yeah. then it, but, like, it's not good or bad. It's just, it's fun, because he puts so much energy into it, and you just roll. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. When I took over, actually, um, that, that karaoke thing was still a thing. And it's weird, because uh, I actually had bartended on Sunset Boulevard for many years on Sunday nights. So Belmont was always my competition. So I was always hating on the Belmont. I was like, fuck the Belmont. Don't go to the Belmont. Like, stay here and drink. Like, why do you want to sing karaoke? Karaoke's lame, you know? And I took over, and uh, it like at some point, they're like, you got to sing. And I'm like, I fucking hate karaoke, blah, 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 <laughs> you know? And then I just, at, at some point, you just give up, you know? And, and I did it, and I was like, you know what? This could be fun. And it's yeah. fun. It can be fun. It's a blast. It's a blast. So let's let's throw it back because obviously everybody knows about the Belmont. But let's talk about you and how we how you got to the Belmont. Like what were you doing beforehand? Obviously you said you were bartending before that. So how did you get into nightlife? And well, how I mean, did this whole thing start in LA? <laughs> I mean, if you want to know the story, it's, it's a long story. Like, you, like that's what we're here for. This brother. is Homer's the Odyssey on this one. I yes. Mean, <laughs> I, mean, I was born in 1971. <laughs> we're talking a long fucking time. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you didn't have to age yourself, brother. In, in all honesty, Dylan still. Looks I'm like he's 25, man. though. <laughs> oh, he does, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, So, like, when I, uh, as a young man, like, or as a young boy, like, growing up, I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. And, we, you know, as a family, we go on trips. And uh, my one of my favorite places always was Los Angeles. So, uh, when I graduated from high school, I, I, I mean, everybody can do the math at this point. When I graduated from high school, I went, I did one year at University of Colorado. Did not do well, uh just didn't go to class, you know, was just like a, a, away from home and just feeling freedom. And I don't know, it was a thing. So after not doing well, my freshman year at University of Colorado, I was, I thought to myself, well, I've always loved Los Angeles. I moved to Los Angeles. So I moved to Los Angeles. And then for the next couple of years, 1991, 92, I worked the rave scene uh, here in LA in 91, 92, Saw the LA riots, the Rodney King riots. That was that was that was That's a trip. Wild. It's a trip to live through two different riots. Wow. It's a trip because like I was there for the 91, 90, I'm sorry, 92 Rodney King riots, and I was here for our riots that we had last yeah. year. And like just kind of um 
differentiating the like between the two of them and how social media has affected that kind of those kinds of events. It's like so different. But I did at you know in '92 drive down Hollywood Boulevard and see every third building on fire, and then just dread straight straight out to Vegas and hang out in Vegas until so it was I'm, again this is just it's more fascinating because I've never heard the story from yeah. you we've been friends for a long time um, and you know we would come to the Belmont after all of the protests that we did this year sure I got <clears throat> I kind of just want to ask what was the biggest difference you saw in that because you said the social media thing we, we're never going to fully see what happened but like if you were comparing the two how, how are they different because that's the, fascinating I think the difference and you can see really the difference is very palpable because you can see like how social media spreads the word so much easier than rotary fucking phones. You know what I mean? Like in 1992, like to get in touch with anyone, you had to either page them from a pay phone Mm -hmm. or like call them on your rotary phone. Some fancy ass motherfuckers had the big brick cell phones. You know, (laughs) I had one for like, Zach Morris. I had one for like, I had one for like four months that was chipped I couldn't I couldn't make any calls out, but I could take calls coming in. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like the thing like you can't carry that shit around in your pocket like a cell phone. Like that thing you could knock somebody out with, you know? And like it was a weird time. Um, but like I think what happened then was uh coordinated attacks on specific areas. So, you know, obviously South Central was a big thing with uh Reginald Denny and dragging the guy out of the truck and football slamming the cinder block on his head. And then, you know, and then they tried to go into K-Town and they all learned you don't fuck with Koreans, right? So, like, but they were trying to. They were trying to roll into K-Town and the the, uh, Korean mafia just got up, uh, Korean regulars just got up on rooftops with rifles and and held everybody off. It's and a whole nother world. Dude, it's a whole nother That's world. You don't, crazy. I mean. I've had some yeah. good times in Koreatown, but yeah, I listen, can tell you don't. You don't know. Nah, Koreatown is one of my favorite parts of Los Angeles. They don't. Hands down. But yeah, you don't, I mean, you don't fuck with Koreans. Like you just don't, you know. Um, you don't really fuck with, you shouldn't fuck with anybody. But um, at that time they were galvanized, you know. And, and, and you know, you listen to Roy Choi talk about it. You listen to. You can see all kinds of videos. They just posted up on rooftops with machine guns, rifles, whatever guns they had, and you weren't you weren't trying it. At that time, it was weird because that was like a very um, kind of post gangster rap era, and L.A. was going through a big Crips and Bloods scenario. So weirdly, you know, Westwood and Century City was kind of like the hot spot with clubs and and parties. And dudes would roll up from South Central and open fire on houses just randomly. Like, I had been at several houses in Westwood in, like, 91, 92, where cars would just roll by and they would just, like, open fire into the house. And usually people didn't get hit, but, like, that shit was happening. Like, you know, South Central was on fire at that time. And you had this, this whole Crip Blood scenario and these wars, and they extended into the deep, you know, suburban communities uh, especially the party areas, and so I think that's why Hollywood Boulevard had a had a big hit because Hollywood Boulevard is a landmark, and they came up, and there was a you know where LA Fitness is on Hollywood Boulevard mm-hmm. that used to be a Good Guys or a uh, what's the other one whatever it is there was there was right there where that Walgreens or at CVS is yeah. at the bottom of the staircase at LA Fitness on Hollywood yeah. Boulevard that was a electronic store, and I remember that window being broken out. And I was driving to pick up my friend who lived, I think, on Highland, like, and Franklin, like, right around that area. And um, it was, like, right around that area. And having to drive down, there was people coming out of that, good guys with, like, TVs and shit. Wild. And people were rushing cars. So I had to, like, I had to turn, like, every third building on Hollywood Boulevard was on fire. And I had to, like, turn off Hollywood Boulevard. Because people were just rushing cars, and I had like a little Honda Prelude. <laughs> so you were getting in and out quick, yeah. though. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm an Asian man with a Honda Prelude. It was kind of a sad thing, but like that's what it was, you know. And uh, and like, yeah, I had to like, yeah. Let's go. So, so I picked her up um, at her place, which I think was like somewhere around there, and I, I can't remember exactly where it is because it's so different now, you know. Yeah. But then I remember we just jetted right up Highland, hit the 101. 
and just took off and went went straight to Vegas and then hung out in Vegas until everything subsided. And then coming back into L.A., you'd roll down Hollywood Boulevard and every third building would be burnt down. And they'd be like, That's some crazy. of them would have like flowers on them. Some of them would have like notes that said like, um, I, I saved every single dollar I had, uh, moved from Armenia to Los Angeles and opened up this poster shop and now I got nothing. You know, and it was a it was a crazy time, but it was very similar to what happened here. I was definitely more frightened this last time than I was in the early nineties. Really, I think also because I was twenty then. Okay, twenty. Yeah, I was twenty. Twenty. I was twenty, and like when you're twenty, you don't you don't have fear. You know what I mean? You feel invincible. And then, like, but, and also this time, anarchy kind of spread throughout the city a little bit harder yeah. than it did yeah. then. I think then it was very localized. It was very specific areas that were getting hit. And now, this time, it was like kind of everywhere. Yeah, like you said, get, with social media, you knew where right. everything was. Yeah. So it wasn't like a surprise, like, holy shit, it's yeah. just, you're and like, oh my God, it's getting it. close to me. Yeah. And they would organize it. Yeah. They'd be like, yo, we're going to be at this corner at this time. And, and then we're going to be at that corner at that time. And we're going to be at this park at this time. And we're going to move and go to all these spots. And here's the route. And right. And yeah. it's like, like, the, like, you know, and then they had flyers and social media and all that stuff. But back in the day, they didn't have that. So it was like, it was kind of like they had to coordinate in a different way. And it was a lot less effective. Damn. I mean, I love the tangent we just went off. <laughs> <laughs> Heading back, too. Because, no, I mean, that, that, that's just something that I know yeah. we've spoken about. And Nick, our producer, we've had a lot of conversations about this. And, you know, just how this whole year has been. But that, that's definitely a take I never got. So yeah. I, thank you for that. But so, but so back to how you got into then. So you're here. You're 20 years old. You come back now. So I did the rave scene for, like, a bunch, yeah. of, a bunch of years. Um, Like, no, not a bunch of years. Two years. And then um, at that time, you know, I think L.A. was a very different animal than it is now. And uh, I realized I got I to gotta go back to college. So I, I went back to University of Colorado, graduated from there, and then ended up working in bars there. And um, Was this after the riots? This was after you the left? riots. Okay. 92, was, 92 was the riots. Like, I think it was like May 92 or something like that. And then I might be off by a month or whatever. I think I'm pretty sure it's May, it was May, though. Because I remember there was a Rosala rave that we were all supposed to do, and then Rosala rave got canceled because like, the LA riots happened. Wow. <laughs> remember her? Everybody's free to feel good. Remember mm-hmm. that song? Anyway, mm-hmm. so then I um, I I packed up my shit. I went back to college in Colorado, um, and then I started working at bars. Um, my junior senior year, I worked at this bar called Taylor's on the on the hill in Boulder, Colorado. And I think that was like the beginning of like me just uh, and my downward spiral into nightlife. <laughs> I love how he uses the word downward yeah, spiral that was into, in, into nightlife, but like. But honestly, we talk about the downward spiral, but like, yes, there was a downward spiral and I want to hear the mental toll it's got. It had to take, especially this year with COVID and being a bar owner. You're you're the first bar bar owner we've had on this show. I can only imagine what that was. Yeah, I can only imagine what that was like for you as long as, as well as everybody else who's really going through it. Like thinking if you, like we had a conversation, you weren't sure if you were going to think about selling the bar. We were all like, ah, you can't do that. It was definitely up in the air, man. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I started working at bars in Colorado. I think like... (laughs) I got, I was a skinny, like 6'3", like I was probably like 175 pound, like Chinese kid. I wasn't, I mean, I was, I'd been in my fair share of street scrambles, but like, I wasn't like a tough guy by any measure of the imagination. I got hired as a door guy. But the craziest thing is like in, in Boulder, when you go to college there, like a lot of the bars, I don't know how it is now. This is like a million years ago, but a lot of the bars were in like either in one place or the other. So it was like either Pearl Street or the Hill. Mm-hmm. I worked on the Hill. And what my, what they hired me as a door guy, but then they would just feed me cocktails and then they would go, Hey, go check out the other bars and see what's happening at the other bars and come back and give us a report. So I would be scouting other bars and then grabbing girls from other bars or whatever and bringing them back down to the bar. So I think that was the impetus of me becoming a promoter. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's really was like kind of what happened. I was, I was officially security. <laughs> that's amazing I didn't know we went from security to bar owner. Yeah, that, that's he, definitely a whole <laughs> you weren't secure in a club you were securing the women going into the club I was security I mean I had got in my fair share of tussles too yeah. but like but yeah I mean like a lot of times and my 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 fellow fucking uh, security guards would be like 
the, uh, like our buddies that we all got hired with were like, why do you get to go from bar to bar and have drinks? And I was like, I don't know. I just, I'm just that guy, you know, like <laughs> I'm the skinniest one, you know, I don't know. Like I, so I, uh, they sent me on the missions and I guess that was the beginning, you know, I don't know. And then, um, that was it. That was like how I started nightlife. After that, I, uh, I moved to Honolulu for a year and a half, surf for a while after I graduated from college and then went up to San Francisco. And I lived in San Francisco for about six years. Um, and there I worked with um, this, there's a legendary a duo named Martel and Nabil that are like the oldest school, like San Francisco promoters from like house clubs back in the day. They were dear friends of mine, awesome guys, the best guys you can ever, ever hope to meet. Um, I worked with them. I started DJing for a long time. Um, I was in that whole like San Francisco house music scene with uh, Miguel Miggs uh, when they like interviewed Madonna and they were like, what's, what are you listening to right now in Rolling Stone? And she was like, I'm listening to Miguel Miggs. Like it was like a crazy thing. It was like this nineties house music revolution in San Francisco. And I was like kind of DJing. I was running clubs, um, promoting parties. And then, um, I realized halfway through there, I was like, I've always wanted to live in Los Angeles. I don't like San Francisco. Like I'm having as much fun as I can here, but I know that it's be- it can be better down there. Yep. So then I moved back down to L.A. around 2000. There was no house music in L.A., so I quit. Started bartending again. Um, ended up bartending at uh, Saddle Ranch. Got a job through my boy Mark Harris. Um, and I worked with a lot of the prominent bar owners now. Yeah. Craig Lay, me, you know. I mean, all the, like, it was just all, like a bunch of us that all kind of came up in the system. Back then. It all started at Saddle Ranch. It did. A lot of the shit started at Saddle Ranch. I've heard that. I've heard Saddle Ranch was like a bit like a big mecca meeting place for a lot of people. I'm That's like, one of the first places weird. I went to when I, I got to LA. Ranch. I got to LA in 05, and that was like one of the first places that I, yeah. I went to. Wasn't there a reality show about what There you was. Know? It was after me. Right? I didn't oh, okay. work there then. <laughs> Real I worked quick. there for just like about yeah. a I worked there just just about a year and a half in the early two thousands, like two thousand and two, two thousand three. But I'm friends with almost everybody that I worked with then now that I know all of them and they like, you know, there's a lot of guys that have, have had to come up on that, that scene from then, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to watch everybody kind of like grow and change and stay. Oh, definitely. I mean, we, we've seen that with all of our friends and like, cause we're in this cusp now where we're kind of, you know, get, I thought I was out getting out um, and being at that age where like, all right, it's time to, to move on. It's like yeah. I said, it's either you make that move into executive upper management or, or you own your own bar. Right. Or you get the fuck out and do something else. Yeah. Yo, so I, I, I want to tell you uh, how I went to, for an interview at Saddle Ranch one okay. time. But I want you to set up what Saddle Ranch is like and what the people that work there are like. Like the what people dress like. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, like, it's it's uh, it's a country western bar that uh, used to be a place called Thunder Roadhouse on Sunset Boulevard back in the, like, 80s and 90s. And Thunder Roadhouse... If you lived in L.A. before our time, you did not go out on Hollywood Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard. You just did not. It was not a place. Still don't. (laughs) Well, not not now, yes. But, like, there was a time when Sunset Boulevard was super hot. Yeah. And that's probably when you guys first, I don't know if you came up after that. Came here after that, or I was whatever. in like 2012 by the time I got out. Yeah, okay, so that I was, was five. Yeah. After was that? Yeah. Well, well, five Sunset Boulevard was pretty hot still. Yeah. I think. Yeah, but there was a time when it wasn't, and I think the guy who really uh, changed that was this guy Larry Pollock, who kind of changed the whole scene of Sunset Boulevard at one point in time. And at one point in time, Sunset Boulevard became like the hottest place to hang out in in L.A. And uh, he created a, a place called Saddle Ranch which is a country western rock and roll bar and people <laughs> it has a bull people people had like the, the 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 people who work there have to dress accordingly right so like bandanas on their heads or they have to look like just goofy LA country western Cowboy. people there was a point in time actually when I was working there you'll love this when I was working there where uh they called all of, we had we had like monthly meetings and um and uh people would yell at us at those monthly meetings. He'd be like, you need to do this. You need to do that. It was kind of like a, it's almost like a cheer. I don't know. It was, it was, it was like a, I don't know. They don't do it anymore. Thank God. But at one point in time, they decided, Oh, um, every hour we're going to play cotton eye Joe. Okay. And when we play cotton eye Joe, all everybody who works here has to get up either on the bar or on the floor 
and do a choreographed dance. And I was already in my 30s, and I was like, no fucking way. <laughs> I was like, listen, motherfucker. I love the cotton eye, Joe. You can legit fire me. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I am not doing a jig to cotton eye Joe. Right. Every time you put it on, once an hour. It, once an hour, man. That's, that's You a can lot. go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like, legit. And I was like, there is no fucking way. And I didn't. I never did. Um, but they had meetings where they, like, taught us the dance. And I just sat in the back, just grouchy. Just grouchy. And I was like, there's no way I'm fucking doing this. <laughs> Yo, so that's a great setup for Saddle Did range, you do so. it? I never did. I never that's did. That's awesome. I never learned I, the dance. I never did the dance. I'm not that guy, dude. You know me. Come <laughs> yes. on, Mike. So this place is like, it's it's super Hollywood, but it's got Very a country like facade. Yeah. But yeah. everybody dresses like ripped jeans and like bandanas on sure. their heads and Cowboy like crazy boots. hair. Yeah. So my friend, uh, I believe her name was Summer. I don't know if you if you knew Summer, but I might have known. She her. was a bartender there, and and she knew I was looking for a job oh, at I know the time. Summer. She married an Asian guy. Yes, yes. Yeah, she's a good friend of mine. Shout out Summer. Love I love you. her. Yeah, we love you, Summer. So <laughs> she's like, look. They do the open calls here every what, Wednesday or whatever. And yeah. she's like, go, go uh, interview. And I was like, do, do I need to talk to anyone? She's like, no, just show up with everyone else. And she didn't give me a, a good uh, forewarning. Mm. I come from New Orleans. When we go on interviews, we wear button up shirts and, yeah. a, and ties right. and dress pants. French common law, baby. So I fucking, I put on Sunday's best and I show up at Saddle Ranch and I look around, I'm like, I don't fucking belong here, dude. <laughs> Everybody's like in, like they're going out to fuck to, to a club dressed up. And I'm like, hey, are they here to drink or are they? I'm like, I'm here to interview. And I mean, I walked in and they, and they looked at me and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not getting a job. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I didn't I belong there either. walked out. I, I was so, because, you know, it's so Hollywood anyway. Yeah. You know, you, when you first get here, you're so intimidating yeah, to oh, walk yeah, into yeah. that. And I'm like, fuck, they probably thought I was the manager coming in there. But not even that. The manager was dressed like that, too. Listen, it was the best thing that ever happened to you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I didn't belong there either. I was yeah. almost 6'3", Hawaiian Chinese guy in his 30s. Yeah. You know you know what I mean? Like, I like I, I worked in the service bar in the back until they pulled me out. Like, so I got a cush job there. There was a service bar. If you go to Saddle Ranch to this day, in the back of the bar, there is a wall. And... The, there's guys who sit in a bar back there and make just drinks for the servers. And they make like, you know, 250 bucks a night back in the day, 300 sometimes. Solid, you know, yeah. yeah. It's good money for doing nothing. You never have to talk, talk to a customer. Service bar is like the best. That's the best shit ever. Yes, you know that. Ever. You guys know that. Oh, yeah. You know no, that. I don't want to be in, I don't you be don't in front of people. No and then, then they pulled me out to main bar because they figured out that I could fucking sling. And that's when I quit. <laughs> They're like, really? I gotta, I gotta work the main bar and do a Cotton Eye Joey. Fuck no, this. Fuck that, dude. There's <laughs> not enough money on this planet to pay Dylan to do the Cotton Eye Joe oh and bartend the front. And listen, bar. man, like I love, like Larry Pollock was the uh, like the owner, and I love Larry. We aren't on good terms, but like I haven't set foot in there in a really long time. And like I know they're they were really successful through the pandemic because yeah. they figured out that they could move tables out into. The they have more tables outside more than they than have before. inside. Yeah, which is great. I drove past there the other day. It was packed outside. They have, you know what? It's become the TikToker's paradise. It's oh, like oh, dude. all the TikTokers hang out there. So you, at any given point in time, you can see like, like 30 19-year-old girls rolling out of there. And, and like, yo, they have, so actually the last night I party with you was a few weeks ago and me and a buddy of ours were at Saddle Ranch beforehand and the table next to us was these, they had a camera on the yeah. table and not that I'm not saying that I'm not on TikTok because I definitely am and it's addicting, but like, yeah, it's it's definitely like that now. Yeah. It's wild. So how did, okay, so now let's get to the Belmont though because now again, the Belmont is one of our favorite places in the watering hole. So how did well, you end you up again. owning that belt? How did you end up owning the Belmont? So what happened was after I worked at Saddle, I did my tour of bars and Los Angeles uh, bartending and then uh, I landed um, working for a guy named Michael Bezerra who owns all the Cabo Cantinas and uh, he uh, had a, a his favorite bar that was his bar was called the Sunset Trocadero which is yeah, it's still there. you know the Trocadero yeah, the right so I ran Trocadero for a long time on the nights that I worked for him um, and I, I at that time because I had worked at Saddle I'd worked at Cabo's and around the city I knew people I would and then I was promoting parties um, my guys and I, uh, Mark Harris, and Travis Clemens, like we did like, um, you know, my space, my house, um, Coco DeVille was our, was our, was our favorite. Um, we did a bunch, you know, we did, 
we did a bunch of the clubs all over Los Angeles. Um, and we were promoting there for a little while. Um, and then, so, you know, you meet a lot of people as we all do. And then at some point I just was getting to be that age. But when I worked at, um, Saddle Ranch back in the day, right around, I worked there 2002 to like right sometime around 2003 or 2004, a lot of people would get fired. And a lot of those people that got fired ended up working at the Belmont in like 2002, 2003, 2004. And um, so a lot of us that were bar guys in LA and bar girls would go and hang out at the Belmont. And Belmont was unequivocally like my favorite bar in Los Angeles. Like, you know, every Friday night I would sit at the back bar with my girl Dana, who I used to work with at Saddle. And we would just chill and I would have drinks and blackout and the whole thing. At that time, it was crazy. Like La Cienega was on fire, right? Because you had um, Greystone, which wasn't Greystone at that time. It was area. Area it was area. And across the street where Fig and Olive was was a club, which I can't remember what that was called. And then there was Belmont, and then uh, Greg Morris and Paul Ross, who owned Belmont, they had, well, Greg Morris had that one. Across the street had Spanish Kitchen, which I think has been a number of things since then. And then up the block was um, Oak Fire, Stone Fire Pizza. And the valet line would start at Belmont, and it would go all the way up to Santa Monica Boulevard. Jesus Christ. Like, it, like, like La Cienega was on fire yeah. at that point in time. It was like the place in West Hollywood to hang out because there's a bunch of bars you could bounce back and forth between and then you could go to clubs after. So, you know, um, uh, so I would hang out there all the time and then eventually, uh, right around like the late 2000s, I was like, dude, I got to do something with my life. Like, I can't just keep bartending and, you know, promoting parties and stuff. I got to do something. And I got, I had some buddies that had bought a bar. They had bought Brew House uh, over on, uh, Wilshire in uh, Brentwood and I, I, I pulled together a contingent we got some money together and we were looking at bars all over the city and we we're like you know what we should do we should create a vibe with an outdoor patio and an inside a lot like the Belmont and then at one point in time one of our guys who was involved in the project who later was not involved was like dude the, the Belmont's for sale why would we go create a Belmont somewhere else when we could just buy the Belmont? Yeah. And so that's what happened. It's kind of a dream. It's like you just end up buying like your favorite bar. Yeah. You know? That's so cool. Yeah, it was really yeah. I mean, dude, thank you, Mike. But it was really that's cool. So it was cool. cool. Um and you know, a lot of the people that were employed there that I had been friends with for years were still there. And I didn't we didn't fire any of them. Like we just kept them all. You know? Super Yeah. Cool. I mean, normally, and I would not advise that to anybody ever. <laughs> <laughs> and much love to all the people that who know that whatever. But like, and I kept them, and they were still great. I mean, you know, because we're friends, they were loyal, you know. Um, but, go, but to their credit too, like most of them within the first year of me owning the bar, or two years, uh, moved on. They were like, oh, the party time here is over. Our boy owns it now. Maybe he stepped up in the world we have always had these aspirations and dreams to do our things. And so they kind of like also transitioned into their own lives and they all did different things. And it, just, we just kind of recreated it. And, you know, I just thought to preserve the spirit of what it was, cause it was always kind of an industry place, you know, it was always a place where a lot of industry people hung out cause it's kind of central. And, um, so I wanted to preserve that. You know, um, to this day, I think, you know, we just have a lot of industry people coming through and, uh, that's, you know, industry people are our people. Yeah. We need to, we need to, you know, give us a, we need to have a place where we can be industry people, hang out with industry people, yeah. you know? And, uh, you know, I find that that's very few and far between. Yeah. And so I really tried to cultivate that again at, at, at the Belmont and then kind of recreate it. I mean, it had its day. Belmont in about 2008, 2007, 2008 had a big fire. And they went kind of, that after they had the fire, they had to close and, and reopen. And I think reopening took a little longer than they thought. And it kind of fell out of favor. Because a lot of places had kind of, Laura Hardware had opened, mm -hmm. Hudson had done their thing. A lot of places had kind of come in and taken over or, or done the same thing. And then when Belmont had the fire, they kind of fell out of favor. Because people were, became used to going to these other places. 
And when we took over, it was not ringing well. It wasn't doing that well. And the owners, I think, had been over it for a while. But I knew, I always knew that it had, has that history and, you know, always had potential to be one of, like, a place for us. Yeah. You know, and, and so, and for everyone, really. But, you know. It's definitely a place for everybody. Like we said, within the industry, it's known as the watering hole. And something that we always touch on on the show is just, like, it's that bond of nightlife. Like, every time you go there and you meet somebody, it's an instant chemistry because you're in the industry, too. We got something we can relate and we can talk about. And there's just, there's this family. I mean, I've had so many nights with you in that back bar. Yeah, sure. God knows what time in the morning. Um, <laughs> just hanging. But, like, <laughs> no, but, like, but, but, not, but not even any no, of that. Kidding, but, but, like, but, like, just the people we were with. Yeah. Like, because we all worked throughout the week. We all didn't sure. see each other. So then on Sunday night, it was just like, let's chill, swap stories about the week. It's good to see my friends. I've been dealing with shitheads all week. I just want to be with my people. Like, it, that was, and that's still the feel, though. Yeah. I think that's important, you know? I mean, I think that, you know, coming up as an industry guy, it, it, it was very, very important for me to create an industry place, you know? And um, I also know that after my experiences, like bartending on Sunset, where like summer used to come in all the time with the whole Saturday Night's crew, you know, mm-hmm. and like the whole Cabo crew would come in and everybody like standard crew would come in, you know, and then it was like, oh, I get it. Like you create something where we can all hang out and then we can all hang out. Did you ever um, get to a point where you had to be like selective of who you let in or was it a bar? Because I never had a problem walking, just walking in there and seeing celebrities and, you know, was there ever a time where you had to like, oh, okay, I have to do crowd control basically? I mean, I think we all have had, you guys have definitely had that more than me. Yeah, I mean, um, SBE was, I, yeah. I worked there, I couldn't even get into Hyde. What, I, they, I swear to God, they, well, only it was the most embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two of those people were working, everybody yeah. else. Paris was Hilton and then whoever else. Yeah, exactly. Seven people. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking SBE, man. But yeah, no, I hear you. Um, you know what? Belmont's never really been like that. The the best part about Belmont too is like like I said, like what what Mike touched on. We we have that back bar, right? So a lot of times, if celebrities come through, we can kind of section off that back bar, and they can come through there. Yeah, you know, like um, you know, we had to do that for Wahlberg when he came through. It was mm-hmm. like, and you know, he wasn't really interested in talking to new people, so we just got him in there and. He hung out for a little bit and had some cocktails and then rolled out. And yeah. That's happened a bunch of times, yeah. you know. But you know what? To be honest with you, it's also a place where celebrities come through a lot and they just have their lunch or they have their cocktails or whatever. And, and you know, paparazzi is just never really concerned because they don't – it's not on the map for them. Yeah. You know? But like a, literally a block down, yeah. the paparazzis are just swarming because it was, it, was, it was prey before area, right? right. Wasn't it? It was prey, prey before. No, pray, was was prey? Was it prey? I think it was prey. At one point, it was the gate. I oh, think. the gate. Yeah, it was Her- the gate back in the day, day. Right. But then I think it was prey. What what was up oh, on was sunset? Was prey on sunset? Or privilege was on sunset? Privilege was on sunset. Privilege Where, was on sunset. Right. I get because the PRs. I get mixed up. Yeah. Pri- yeah. Prey. Yeah. 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 Privilege was actually the first club I ever tried to get into. Oh, yeah. Someone told me I was on the list, and I was not on the list. <laughs> I was not, there was a list, and then there was another list. Yeah. I wasn't on the other list. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I sat up there like a jackass. I didn't get in. SBE has made me wait fucking many We've times. All had We've all had, man. yeah. We've all, I mean, oh, we, every God. single last one of us, man, you know. And, 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 and it's those experiences that make us realize no club is worth waiting in line for. No. Oh, I will never. Never. Now I'm like, make me wait. Yeah. I'm tired. So no, I, I no, I don't. I don't. I don't say that. I mean, to fuck in. I don't go to nightclubs. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not anymore. Like, yeah. like we're we're all past that heyday where it's like we're going out. Yeah, let's just hit a regular bar and call it a day. I, like I don't have the audacity to go to the nightclub, deal with the promoters, the little kids, and everybody in there, and they all think they're cool. And we're just like, I just want to drink. I want to be able to conversate with a it's friend. It's weird. Here. It's weird. You get to that point, right? Where like you reach that age, which I think happened to me much later than you guys, but like, <laughs> but like you reach that age where you're like, dude, I just like, what is the point of going to a club? Like, I mean, it's fun, but it's different. It's just a different scenario. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean, we've hit on it a few times, like even how I was joking now, like I waited outside a line, but, but then like years later I was 
you know, at the top of the food chain of working for SB. Sure. And I didn't want to be caught dead in the club. I was, of course. I was like, I got to go to this club again. And even when I was going out to have fun, I'm like, I wasn't having fun. It was, I was, and I was masking it with, with drinking and whatever else I was doing at, the, at those times. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a fascinating thing. Cause like, you know, um, uh, being as old as I am or coming up when I came up, like I, I actually had this view that bottle service ruined nightclubs. Like I firmly believe that. I think that, I think that, you know, it's, it's fair to say in a capitalist society that bottle service is eventually like an inevitability. But growing up, when I used to go to one, like my clubs, when I started clubbing in LA, like, you know, Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. like there wasn't bottle service. Like, and everybody starts on the equal ground. And you, and that's different. And, and everybody's, you walk into a club as a man and it's like you start on an even ground with everybody else. And it's about your charm. It's about, you know, I mean, obviously, if you have a bunch of money and you walk to the bar and go, I'm buying everybody drinks, you might be a celebrity for that five seconds that that's happening. And that's good for you. It's the same thing as bottle service then, you know. But back in the day, you walked into a club on equal ground with everybody else. And if you wanted to fucking dance with a girl, you'd be like, yo, I'm feeling that girl over there. You know, maybe you try to buy a drink. Maybe it doesn't work or it does or whatever. But everybody kind of starts on an even playing field. Now it's like, or historically, I mean, not now because there's no clubs, but yeah. historically, you know, then you guys, which you guys know better than anyone, it's like, what table are you at? Can we bring girls into that table? It's mm-hmm. a whole different scenario. It's a whole different vibe. And I, and I, and I was promoting it to being a bottle service too. And I, I had to kind of, you know, relearn everything and figure it all out. It's different. Mm-hmm. It was, I think it was a lot more fun, yeah. but maybe I was also younger. I don't know. You no, know? you're right, man. Like I remember those times when, when I first got to LA, I would go out to clubs and I would act, people were still dancing. Yeah. And now nobody fucking dances. Stand, they're just, you you're, they're standing the around looking around like which next table they could get to or. They know. sit at the highest seat they can find. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whichever booth has the biggest back. Yep. Right? They sit on top of it. Whichever bottle buyer has the most money. And God bless you for having the most money. I'm not judging. But like at that time, like it just, it doesn't seem that fun, right? Yeah. It's not that fun. Now it's become about status and clout. Right. And like if you don't have that money, you kind of feel like shit when you go to the club. Sure. And you're not that guy blowing money and you want to talk to that girl, but she won't give you the time of day because sure. you're, and you're like, well, what am I doing? It, it sets up this unrealistic ex- expectation yeah. sure. of life. That's why I always hit on the bartenders. Yeah, that's that, smart. <laughs> yeah, that growing up, that was like, that's my thing. I love hitting on, uh, I don't want to say the help because I, I could say that because I've, I've been the help forever. Yeah, right, right. But She's one of us. Yeah. She's I, one of I, us. Yeah. That was like the ultimate, like getting a girl who's at the club, whatever, but getting the girl that's behind, behind the, the bar, bar. Yep. they're like the unicorns, man. They're right. so hard to get. Right. I love y'all, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Mad love, mad love. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yo, you're a hundred percent right though. But I mean, definitely nightlife has changed so significantly over the years. And as we're seeing coming out of COVID and, and as we move into this next year of 2022, it's still progressively changing. hundred percent. And we don't even know, like, you know, we won't get a full aspect of what it really is until at least the middle of 22. when we're kind of back to some sort of normalcy of, of life, whatever quote unquote normal actually is. I would love for that to happen. We'll see. You know, but like, yeah, I mean, we, just talk, we were just talking about this. Like, everything has changed. Like, you know, your guys' pedigree, my pedigree, everything we've learned over the years, like, mm-hmm. that might all be nothing at this point. Right. Because yeah. who knows what the future of this industry looks like, you know? And we put so much work and effort so into much. where we are. So yeah. much. I, I, I kind of see it, uh, bottle servings actually having a, like, a point because now you could separate people. Right. Oh, yeah. You know that's I mean? interesting. Yeah, I've never even thought of it from that perspective. There's all, I mean, so clubs are already set up for that. Sure. But they're they're not set up for like bar scenes. Like, like separating I, I, be, the crowd right. now seems logical right. versus like anti-fun. Yeah, you have a minimum of people who you let at your table. And- Correct to a certain extent because if you look at some of these other cities like a Florida or Atlanta who just don't give a fuck, um, who just don't give a fuck at all. That's kind of where we stand up. Yeah. I've touched on this plenty of times before. It has changed clubs, but in the festival world for me now, it is now the biggest thing. 100%. Because now you kind of, like when you go to festivals, you lose people. 
Absolutely. Now you have a place for everybody to retreat to. Absolutely. 100%. So it's become a big thing in the festival circuit. And yeah. I think going back, you know, uh, as the world reopens, as we continue to go, that festival circuit is just going to take over. But I've said this plenty of times before. Once the festival circuit started becoming as, as more impactful as it has been and the Sky Deck and the VIP services, that's when I started to see nightclubs start to die out. Sure. Right. Well, the other thing, too, about bottle service is crazy is like it, it – it definitely made clubs not as fun, but it definitely made club owners make a lot not more fun. fucking money, man. Oh my god, the ridiculous you know? prices. Yeah, I mean the the ability to sell, you know, a thirty dollar bottle of alcohol for a thousand dollars, versus breaking that down into shots and then selling it for you know, I mean, behind the bar. I mean, there's a reason why all the clubs went that direction. Hundred percent. Or even crazier that you're selling a three hundred and thirty dollar bottle of champagne for twenty three hundred dollars. Sure. Right. Like it's that's. A, 2,000% markup. That's insane. Yo, you see that list from fucking uh, Dre's Rooftop? That bottle, the 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 uh, the uh bottle list from Dre's Rooftop in Vegas is one of the most insane things I've ever seen. Oh, is it like the $100,000 packages? No, there was a $757,000 package. Jeez. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. You've seen that one? Yeah, I've seen it that It is one. the most ridiculous thing you've oh. ever seen. It's like a fireworks display, a personal fireworks display. Um, you, they, they send you a 757 for you and 50 of your best friends to get on the f- plane wherever you're yep. w- in Sandusky, Ohio, or wherever the fuck you are, and they'll, they'll they fly, fly you out. into Vegas on a 757, and then they give you like, I don't know, I don't know, it was like, like 100 yeah. bottles of Dom Luminous, 100 bottles of this, it's 100 bottles crazy. of that, a Methuselah of this, and this, and then you get a fireworks display, but it was $757,000. I bet you they sell one of those a week. I, don't know. <laughs> I know that sounds like a Saudi thing. Yeah, that's not that. That's a specific type of clientele. But I know at high at uh, the Bellagio and high. You know how they have the fountain. There is a package for 120 grand where what? they they bring out a. I think it's like 20 bottles, a couple Missoulas, but you could hit the button and pick the song no. for the fountains to start going. No, what? Yeah. So you would just decide, like, you know what? I want, I want all Dom P. I want Michael Jackson bad to play, and I'm going to hit the button, and we're going to watch the water go. That's crazy. Like, the ridiculous kinds of packages that we come up with. Yeah. yeah. Are, bro, I've had some events where, like, if you buy the $100,000 package, you get a specialized hat yeah. that nobody else gets. And it's crazy because it's got nothing to do it, – it's all about the – um, you know, the showmanship that's of like, course. oh, nobody else can buy that hat. I can only get it for $150,000 for this package. Give me the $150,000 package. They don't touch the champagne, but because they got that hat, that makes them exclusive. That's the whole 120 right there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> like, that's the crazy, <laughs> but like, that's the And then crazy. you see the status, you see a staff guy walking around with the same yeah, hat. Like, yeah, what yeah. the fuck? But like, that's Some the crazy. Yeah. yeah, but that's the craziest thing about all this. It's like the way that nightclubs have learned how to play on ego. Yeah. Isn't because that's what all this is. Let's be it's real. That's the is. driving force it's of this. All it is. Is, the more money I spend, the more girls I get, the cooler I look. I mean, you guys have seen it a million times. Yeah. One one table across the way from the other table. One of them is this hip hop star. One of them is that hip hop star. That one gets the fi- thirty five or fifty bottles of Dom. That one gets the fifty bottles. Of Dom. And mm-hmm. It's just a it, and it's bottle just, wars. It's just wars. You know, it's ego wars. Yeah. And it's crazy because like I think once. Once nightclubs started becoming bigger, you see the designs of nightclubs are purposely set up for that. Absolutely. Like you look at Emerson, Colony, all these spots, my house, they were set up in that shape so you can see all the other bottle buyers. And that's yeah. done on purpose. Yeah. The design is purposely built like that. Yeah, it's like an oval. Like Everybody can see each other. You can see what every table is doing at any given time. Yeah, Miami is – they know their shit in Miami that way. Miami's the best when it comes to nightclubs. Absolutely. Hands 100%. Down. 11. <laughs> Danny Solomon, what's Period. up? But one of my favorite places in the. I go to Miami if I'm there for seven nights. I'm in eleven for six. You ever been to eleven? Well, no. you're actually only uh, in eleven for like one. Just one very long. For, night. Yeah, it's just one. <laughs> so eleven is. We haven't touched on eleven, but how fourteen is here? That's eleven in Miami. Like yeah, 11, all the time. Eleven, 11 is, is the club that that everyone told me it's the best club I've ever been to in my entire life, and I was and it, I was late on the game on that one because I had stopped going to Miami for a while, and I was like. Okay, everybody's talking shit about this 11 place, whatever. I went and I was like, I went on like a Wednesday when it was dead to rights. I mean, it wasn't dead to rights. It was slow. Yeah. And I went and I looked around and I was like, this is the best club I've ever been to in my entire life. And I went back Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's a 24-hour nightclub that is also a strip club that also has a Michelin star 
restaurant on the rooftop and mm-hmm. also has private rooms for you to sleep in because there's been plenty of times I've dropped my luggage off thinking I'm going to make my flight and I don't make my flight. Yo, what the and hell are we doing level- here? <laughs> and high level DJ. That shit's tell- open. Yeah, Let's like, go. Yeah. And, and <laughs> actually, but, but like as a guy who came from nightlife, like when I walked in that place and people had told me, oh, this is the great, like, and people. Who, Same. Like I didn't. Yeah. I walked in, but it's, it's actually like the way it's designed, the flow. You go into any club, any bar, there's always a flow problem. Always, you know, and with with the way Eleven is constructed, it's it's just like it's a perfect flow. It's just a constant movement. You know, you you, you get there's a few bottlenecks here or there, but not extreme the way a lot of clubs are. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, Greystone, that bottleneck was crazy. Yeah. You know, um, but any club, the yeah. bottle, they get the bottleneck and it's not good. Right. The way that club is constructed and the way they built it was just so purposeful and you feel it when you're in there. There's a flow of energy, the flow of the vibe, people moving consistently, properly. And it's just like, it just, it, it operates perfectly. I'd be curious to see who built that because- It's the Vegas guys. Are it's they, Vegas are guys. they, because cause you know when you're a former bartender or your TSA or you work in, a, in a, the, the industry for a long yeah. time, you're like, who the fuck designed this place? Yeah. It's usually like people with the money. They don't, they don't yeah, know they anything don't know. about it. Like, they just want to make it fancy. Yeah, you get behind the sticks and you're like, yeah. Where, why is this well here? Why is this, you know, drain here? But I wonder if they, they were like oh, former no, they, they, service they, they, they industry they people. Like, we know some of the guys who own it and some of the partners in it and they all are operations people. They came from the nightlife yeah. setting. Like, yeah, it makes sense. They know. And they took sense. a beating yeah. too. When they first moved yeah. into Miami, the Floridians were like, get the fuck out of here. We don't want any Vegas people here. Yep. Like, and they were dead rights for like, a, like a few months, if not more, maybe the first year. And then all of a sudden people were like, holy shit, this club is fucking awesome. Wow. And now it's like the Miami club. Yeah. And it has been for a long time. It's wild. Cause when you break down, like I haven't been to some of the clubs in Amsterdam and some places in Europe that I heard are just incredible. And I can't wait to actually experience them. But like, I've been to clubs all over the U.S. and everybody talks about Vegas and everybody talks about L.A. and Miami kind of gets thrown in third or fourth, even behind New York. And it's like when you go to Miami, like they say New York is a city that doesn't sleep. And and that's true. However, Miami doesn't sleep if you know the underground spots, because then some of the best parties in my life that I have ever been to have been in Miami. Yeah. Downtown Miami does not close down. I mean, or no, I mean, before COVID, it did not close down. Yeah. Um. And yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, that was always the place. You're right. New York doesn't sleep, but definitely Miami. But Miami's also like a right arm of New York, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of New York presence there. A lot of mm-hmm. girls. I mean, Model I, in New York. In I the think the Miami women summer. are so much more beautiful. Oh, they're, it's crazy. Like, yeah, so one of, one of my favorite stories that somebody has of me. I was going, it was WMC, it was a Sunday night, we were going to, it was 1am, we were going to the Carl Cox party at the Edition Hotel, and I'm walking up the stairs, and these two women come walking down, and I can't even stop looking, and I turn around, and I'm walking up backwards, and I'm up the stairs, and I'm not paying attention, and I busted my fucking ass, and fell back down the stairs from staring at this <laughs> fucking woman. No, it's crazy. Like, they are insanely No, beautiful. Miami is, the, 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 the level of beauty that somehow they... That happens in Miami is is, is insanity. Yeah, it's, it's insanity. Y'all are y'all are giving me that that itch. You know that itch. Yeah, like, yeah I know the but, itch. But but Miami's yeah. one of those places. I'm like, where I want to like, go out now. <laughs> but like, yo, when you go, like, you can't do Miami so for true. more than like Vegas. I can't do for more than three days. Miami, I can't do more than like five because it will suck you whole. Like you. Well, will you'll not just end up moving back. there. And yeah, like, losing your life. Yeah, because 100%. like yo, then, so but also across the street from Eleven, there's another 24 hour nightclub called Space. So once you, and that's like the house, house music. So like once you get really fucked up at 11, then you head over to space for the rest of the night. And space is a half outdoor club too. So now it's 10 AM and you're still going from the night before. And there's just, it's raging though at 10 AM. Yeah. When when I used to DJ winter music conference in like the nineties in, in Miami, um, all my, all my club promoter friends and like all my friends would space, Denny Tenaglia would play at space. And he would play a like 24 hour set, maybe longer, whatever. He had a porta potty on stage and he would play a house music set for however long he fucking wanted, you know? And that was where we went. Like, you know, and yeah, you could be there for an entire day and hear the same DJ for a day, like a 24 hour fucking day. Yeah, it's nuts. And it's all, and space has always been there and they've always killed it. 
um, it's it's insomniac. It's going a now. thing. It's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. I mean, I've had friends who like will leave at, two, at like three a.m., go home, nap, and then wake back up at eight thirty and come back and meet us. Sure. Yeah. See, I was doing that something similar because I'm from New Orleans and we have twenty four hour bars all over the place. Yeah, I love New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a whole different scene. We can, you know, we can get into, that's a whole nother show right there. But yeah, yeah I remember those 24 hours staying out three, three days consecutively. But I used to go to Jazz Fest every year. Yeah. I will say this about New Orleans, that New Orleans is like the realest fun you can have in the country. Yeah. Like when you're going to like Miami and shit, you're boozing, whatever extracurriculars you're doing, whatever. It's like that kind of fun. But New Orleans is like the most like real fun. Yeah. It's like the most organic. I, I think I, I actually have been to New Orleans, I think more times than anywhere else in the world. I love New Orleans. It's just, it's, I think the coolest town in America for sure. Yeah. It's, it's definitely because there's culture. It's not just like a, yeah. a, a nightclub here. It's so next, different. Yeah. I mean, you can be in a speakeasy, you can be in a jazz club, then you can be in a club, then you can be in some underground place. Like it's crazy. Yeah. That place is nuts, Yeah, but I love it. New Orleans is fantastic. hundred percent. Now I really want to go out. <laughs> <laughs> so, this has been a dope episode, and there's been so much we've been learning, and this is that's what we love about the show. It's every person you get on, it's such a different story, and it's been great having you. So, two ways we'd like to close out the show is, one, if you have tips for anybody in the industry now who's thinking about opening up their own bar, what would yeah. you give for them? And secondly, give us your one or two of your favorite, craziest, most memorable stories in your long-time nightlife career that you've had. Um. I, I, you know, I, I thought about like advice, like, and, um, I think like the, the things that I, I can think of off the top of my head for advice are like, um, uh, num- the first thing is pay your dues. You got to pay your dues, man. If you, if you want to be in the nightlife business, like you gotta start somewhere. You gotta be a bar back. You gotta be a TSA. You gotta be a door guy. You gotta pay your dues. You can't just jump into it green and, and and figure out the industry it's if you start at the bottom like and almost like in any career right like you start at the bottom you start in the mail room you know everything from the mail room up i think that the nightlife industry is the same way i think you have to like no matter how cool you think you are or who like or whatever you got to pay dues you got to like figure out what you're doing you got to be the best at what you do and uh and you know, and that's how you become the best at at what you're doing. You know, I think it, that's the mo- one of the most important things. The other thing I will say is that um, once you get there and you're in it, uh, and and this is something I tell my staff all the time, is that no matter how much shit you take, no matter how much abuse, no matter what anyone says to you, that shit is about them and it's not about you. And you're there for a specific purpose. You're there to do a job you're there to make money you're there to create an environment and no matter what anybody throws at you you just gotta find it in your uh, find a kind of self-confidence in your place and just understand that that shit is all about them and not about you and i think that's like one of the most important things about our our business our industry that a lot of people sometimes don't even know like a lot of our friends that have been in it forever yeah you know people take shit real personally and it's just when people do that to you, it's just not personal. You know, it's it's really it's personal. It's about them. It's about what they're going through. It's about their lives and how unhappy they are. And uh, you just can't take that to heart because it'll ruin you at the end of the day. You know, That's some good advice. I mean, that would be my advice, you know. And then and then to prospective bar owners, uh, my advice would be don't fucking do it. <laughs> 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 like legitimately if you love love the fucking bar business if that's what if that like you wake up in the morning you go i can't wait to work in the bar like then go buy a bar if that's just like if you think that it'd be cool to own a bar and you meet more girls or you think that like you know you see your friends and own bar whatever the fuck like go do some other shit make a bunch of money and you'll meet girls like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like don't like b- the bar business is for people who know the bar business and and love the bar business, which I am not one of. But like, but like my recommendation would be like just understand that it's like not all glamour. It's very rarely glamour. Like I find myself 
snaking toilets very often. You know, like if that's like, you know, and for very little money, you legitimately make as a bar owner less money than any of your employees. Last year I saw, I mean, I made no money last year. Like every single employee I had made more money than I did last year, which is fine. I love them and they do a good job, but it's not how you, it's not how you get rich unless you buy five or six of them, then you're in some money. You know? That's great advice for people who are yeah. listening that like they they think, oh yeah, I, I want to own a bar in Hollywood. I'm going to be killing it. No, no, you're you're going to be killing yourself. Yes, yeah, because you because people don't know like the owners in bars they actually work. Yeah, I bartended at my bar for the first like four years I owned it, like five shifts a week. Yeah, you, you still know? bartend there more for us. But well, for you, <laughs> <laughs> for you and me. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think that like. You really, like, anybody who decides to get, I mean, really, I think it's almost universal, right? Any any industry you get in, you should get in it because you have a very, uh, you have a passion for that industry. And if you don't have, like, a passion for the bar business, uh, you know, don't do it. You know, I think that it's one of those things where it just, everybody, the thing about bars is everybody has an opinion because they all go to them. They'll go to the restaurants, same thing. Everybody ha- everybody thinks they know something because they're an elite Yelper. You don't know shit. You know nothing. You know nothing about the bar industry. You know nothing about... If you're a customer, you're a fucking customer. You're a tourist. Like, y- you don't know anything about the business. Get into the business. Learn the business. Like, understand the business. And if you love it, go for it, man. You'll make the world a better place. But if you're if you think that it's be cool to own a bar... Save that for dream time. Like, fucking, you know what I mean? Like, three minutes a day, Vaseline. Like, save it for that time. <laughs> like, don't fucking get involved. It's not for you. It's just not, you know? And we've seen it a million times. Yeah. yeah we all absolutely. have. We all have, you know? Um, everybody thinks they know that shit. You don't know it until you're in it. And I didn't even, dude, I was in the fucking business like 20-something years. Several GM positions under my pocket, you know? DJ, promoter, all that shit. And I didn't know shit about owning a bar until I actually owned a bar. You know? Yeah, it's a whole and different world. It's a whole different world, man. It's a whole different world. And you know, the way you make money is you own three, four, five. You know, I only own one. Um, thankfully, I, you know, I've, I've diversified myself. But like, you you know, it, it, to open five, like I can't even imagine. Like pandemic hit, you got to renegotiate five leases. I got a buddy like Mike Bezzera who owns like all of the Cabos. He mm-hmm. had to renegotiate like 20 something leases. I can't even imagine. Oh, Jesus. I can't Sal imagine Aurora who has like, you know, my buddy Sal who owns, you know, the black market, uh, the local peasants. He owns mm-hmm. uh, Scope Italian Roots. I mean, I, the, every lease that guy had to renegotiate, like I can't even imagine, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, nobody yeah. expected. Obviously, nobody expected COVID to come in and hit yeah. like it did, and like it shook our industry. Sure, it shook it, but everyone. But like you just said, even having one, yeah, it's crazy. It's nuts. This seems like a nice place to take a break. All right, so you've been in this industry for so long. I you feel gotta, like there's something good. You he's gotta have at least. You gotta have some good. I mean, I got some good stories with you. Some we can't definitely can't talk about on air. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think most of the stories you can't most talk about on air. That's for the Patreon. Air. Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're thinking about we're starting we're thinking about starting like a like a like a black vault. You gotta yeah. have a Patreon. Yeah, you gotta have you gotta a have a like Patreon. with those, <laughs> with those cause, cause yo, I mean, and Dylan, we've talked about this because when me and Dylan went to go grab a drink before we even started this podcast, we were just like talking about everything, and he's like, "Yo, man, there's, we got some really good stories, but we definitely can't talk no. about them." Yeah. And I'm like, "Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of things we have to leave off this show, but one day there will be some really good episodes." It's a weird thing though, because like you know, you almost forget, right? Like there's like for I don't know for me, it's yes. been so long, yeah. I forget, and yeah. like and and you're in it every night, so you're totally desensitized to things that are happening, right? Like. You you might have seen Chris Brown slap Rihanna like a couple times at a table and just been like, oh, that's just Chris Brown, you know. And then and then the shit goes viral like, on the news and you're like, oh, well, I saw that at Greystone like seven times. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and I like, actually I, was there. I think when that shit happened. Yeah, too, that's actually. what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. This is what I'm saying. And like and like like over time, you just like it. Just like yo, oh, that shit happened again. And someone around you might be like, 
holy shit, did you see that? And you're like, see what? I see that every night. Yeah, like, it's that we don't live in a... Re- we talked about this. We yeah. don't live... Like, not that we don't live in a reality, but we have a skewed reality. Yeah, 100%. Compared to the norm of regular... Uh, I don't even want to say regular people. To the other people in elsewhere in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. Right. Well, how about you take it back to where, like, when Mike and I weren't here... Like, cause I think I like to hear about yeah, old Holly, robot. old Hollywood. Yeah. I'm quoting, but uh, doing air quotes, but you know, the Hollywood, when you got here, like, like after the riots, like how did, how was that? And like, how was that scene? And that was a crazy scene. That was a, that probably the, some of the craziest shit I've ever seen in my life. If I think about it, that's what we want to hear was yeah. then it was probably like the rave scene when I was like, you know, 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, the stuff that was going on in LA, because that there was a lot of underground clubs. You know, my favorite club at that time was a thing called Flammable Liquid. And with Flammable Liquid, you would call a 213 number at, I think it was like midnight. And if you had the number, you called it, and they would tell you where to go. And every week, every Saturday night, Sunday morning, at 2 in the morning, it was a new venue. And so you would just go to a new place. Sometimes it'd be... At a hotel downtown, um, there was one time it was in a crater, like off the five, right? And they had uh, the DJ Doc Martin was the resident DJ at that time, and like they set up turntable, he was playing, and that the, one of the craziest ones was during the LA riots, uh, the beginning of them. There was a Saturday night, and we all went to this, and it was this crater off the five, and they had the turntables and a bunch of speakers, and we're all like just partying in a crater. And because I think it was the LA riots, they thought it might be related and helicopters came out of the sky and landed like in the middle of the dance floor, basically. And everybody just had to fucking split, you know, and they didn't arrest anybody, but like legitimately like SWAT helicopters came out of the sky and landed. And that's a crazy story. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Could you imagine like being on drugs or something? Just like. It's the craziest fucking party ever. <laughs> the fucking helicopter just yeah. coming in. Yeah, and you're, you're like, like, oh shit, that's the cop. I mean, the legitimately, you're like, know? wait, are those helicopters? Yeah, those are those are helicopters. Right? I'm, I'm you're tra- seeing the same you thing. See that, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you start wondering, like, yo, is this part of the party right now? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you know, I mean, like, we've all seen. Like, I was, I was, uh, I was DJing a uh, an event uh, in San Francisco one night that was a Christmas party, and it was a uh, staff from one restaurant. And it was at a different restaurant, and uh, the staff from the restaurant that that was having the party was Mexican. The kitchen staff was Mexican, and the staff at the restaurant we were at was El Salvadoran. And oh, I'm spinning a house set. I'm spinning this song called "He Is the Joy," right <laughs> about God, <laughs> and He is the joy. And all of a sudden, this freaking like fifty person fight breaks out, where in Dudes with kitchen equipment are stabbing, like other dudes. What? Like literally, they I saw dudes holding their intestines. No, like, yeah, like they, they got slit across, and like and like it, it was just a, a, like a melee Latino freaking war, you know. And I'm playing this house music song called "He Is the Joy." And I I'm still like, want to know how you got a Bible song into a house music mix, but that's a whole yeah, other no, story. Totally, yo. But it was, I mean, like, I mean, we've all, but the thing is, we've all seen that, right? We've all seen people ODing, flopping around like fish out of water. We've all seen crazy sex shit that that we never wanted to see before. You know, I mean, like, but it just becomes like almost second hat where you're like. It's the norm. Yeah, it's the norm. It's the norm. It's like that scene in uh, From Dust Till Dawn when the the, the vampire band is playing with the human guitar guy. And he's like, fumando marijuana. And and there's like (laughs) vampires getting shot and stabbed and blown up. That's yeah. what I just pictured when you told that story. But that's Greystone. <laughs> but that was Greystone on Sunday. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, you know, we like, we've all seen that shit. And it's like, when you think about, like, what's the craziest shit you've seen, it's like, I can't even remember because it just kind of all fades Lens. into the same thing, right? I don't know. Right? Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, and like you said, even Grayson, I remember being at Oak the night that fucking Shug Knight got shot up. Right. And then the night Chris, like with the Chris Brown thing, and people were calling me the next day, like, yeah, you good? I'm like, yeah, this is normal. Normal. They're like, that's not normal. I'm like, oh, actually, no, it's not normal. It's but, not normal for you. It's yeah. normal for us. Yeah. One we're of the best fights I saw was, uh, it was when it, it was industry, right before Greystone. It was industry, it didn't really pop off, but it was kind of yeah, cool. I remember. But uh, we had an Asian night, and I, I witnessed like the best fight ever. 
because these motherfuckers actually did some karate shit. Oh, really? Yes. I mean, like like a flying air. I, and then we were in the middle of La yeah. Cienega because yeah. we had to kick everybody out. And, right. you know, because it was a huge fight that spilled from inside the club to outside. I'm fighting my microphone. Right. But yeah, I mean, they like they squared off and did the fucking. Ah! Yeah. And then I saw a flying kick and, 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 and we're all like workers are like. We have our flashlights and we're like fucking, we have our flashlights on this fight in the flying kick, man. Best fucking fight I've ever seen, dude. Like they threw down. Yeah. If you're listening to this, all Asians know Kung Fu. <laughs> yeah. understand that shit. But I was like, this is the most ironic shit that I've ever, <laughs> you know what I mean? On the flip side of that, we all know that in a lot of times, you know, um, and just to be clear, I'm mostly Chinese and Hawaiian. Asians, a lot of times don't know how to hold their alcohol. I mean, I remember when Bagatelle next to, Belmont oh, after I bought man. that was the worst place but on yep. Saturday one time they uh had an Asian party and they and it was a private party there was probably maybe 30 of them and dude they can until they can't until yes. they can't yes <laughs> yes <laughs> they drink very quickly yes. super it's fast it's a lot at once and it's a lot of Hennessy and Ace two things that I would not expect them to buy but Chivas it's part Regal. of the norm now. for me it was Johnny yeah. Black they just scotch crown crown yeah. crown too. yeah 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 but the, uh, like I remember, there were like five girls, and it was at um, where Bagatelle was. So it was at SDK, right? Yeah. There were five girls. The, the, uh, I think there was a total of maybe fifteen people. Five girls were out on the street. One of them was throwing up into the fountain, like the 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 water fountain for SDK, right? Four of them were flopping on the ground like fit. one of them was getting carried out by the manager, who's who's a friend of mine, vomited onto his face. As he's carrying her out of the place. And one of the barbacks comes over to Belmont. It's like, can I get another bottle of Grey Goose? And I was like, no, motherfucker. You cannot have another bottle of Grey Goose. Right. People are ODing on alcohol <laughs> in front of our place. The fucking driveway is a river of Asian vomit. Like, they're calling like, like dude. It's true. Remember as TSAs, we would have that bucket of the powder. The just cat, all, it was cat mix. Yeah, was it? It was just like, it's, it's so, cat oh, mix, just soak yeah. up the vegan. Yeah, yeah, on standby, like what behind every table. Smart. Because we need, because ha- we can't clean it up. Like that we got to, so we got to clean smart. it up on the fly, and none of us want to touch it. Yeah. So we would throw the kitty litter on it and then sweep it up. That is so smart. Yeah. I'm about to go buy a, 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 a bag of kitty litter. Yeah, you know, it's like, like I know me and Danny never did it. It was always the TSA who was on the bottom of the totem pole of the people right. that we really like. You don't work that hard. You go in and clean up the vomit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, I never, I've never once cleaned up vomit. I did everything, dude. I, I was just. That's my least favorite thing to do. Actually, is clean up vomit. Like I, like I, like I just. Like yo, it. hold your own. Like yo, we've all been there. But like yo, if you're, uh, that's what I just can't understand. It's like yo, if I'm gonna go out, like, and maybe because we're all different and people in the industry know us, so like when we go out, we still gotta be on. But hold your shit together. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's asking a lot from I human know. beings. You know, I mean, like we are in the industry. We're experienced. We, we, you know, we've been around the block a couple of times. It's like there's a lot of people who go out. They haven't been yeah. exposed to that. They're just having the time of their lives. And they're just like, I'm just going to. And they're yeah. just drinking booze. Everything. And then it hits them. And then they start. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't want any of them in my place. Right. But I understand. You know, I don't know. Sometimes it's, I wish like I would just be able to throw up and go to sleep. But no, I have a alter ego, Donnie Homez, that that comes out when I black out. Donnie Homez will have a whole fucking week long adventure. Yeah. And like I'll be like, Danny, you know you did that last time. The what? best part is you're not even responsible for any of that. None yeah. of us. It was Donnie Homez. Yeah. My my <laughs> friends are gonna laugh when they hear this. <laughs> Yo, but how they many, know him but how very many well. of us in this industry all have an alter ego where we'd hit that point where we oh. know we should stop, but we'd let the other person take over. We're like, fuck it. Yeah. In for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. Right. And I'm going. He's had some fun. I just wish I remember it. <laughs> like, I also, like, we've been around the block, but, like, it would also be so much cheaper back in the day if I didn't be part of this industry for so sure, long right. and build up a tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Because we spend, I mean, we don't have to spend money anymore, but, like, we used to have to spend so much money on booze when we would go out. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's true, man. You know, I got to say, like, I was, I'm very thankful for very rarely ever having to buy a fucking bottle. Like, I can't even imagine, like, how kids coming up these days have 1,500 fucking bucks to go to a club. On a Tuesday. Who the fuck has that money? I never had that money, you know? I mean, you know, L.A., obviously, uh, you guys see that there was a meme recently that was the best shit I've ever seen that was like, uh, 
uh, millionaire's uh, daily regime. Uh, like, like, and it was like, wake up 5 a.m., stretch, um, uh, you know, meditate, um, have a, have a, a healthy breakfast, um, you know, 9 a.m., have your daddy give you $10 million. <laughs> like, there's so many of those motherfuckers out there, you know? Oh, and it's just like, and th- then they're like, oh, uh, like, those are the table. Bo-. But I, like, I can't even imagine, like, these kids, like, have to work a nine-to-five fucking job and then go out and spend $1,500 on a bottle. I think we're past the whole nine-to-five job thing. Yeah, well, I mean. I a, lot, a lot of these kids going out are now are we the, the inf- In L.A., Maybe. Because uh, I think a lot of it is now on this whole, a lot of these kids that we see that do come out to the clubs are all these YouTube stars, influencers, and people like that who That's are true. getting paid a lot of money to yeah. just do radical shit. Right. right. Like, I think when we were growing up, that wasn't as, because the internet wasn't as big thing as it is now. Yeah, right. So that wasn't a thing. So I, when we see the younger kids come out, it's usually, if I see somebody who's younger, who's in their early 20s spending money like that, Usually, you're some sort of influencer yeah. or a YouTube. Sensation. Or you got you got family money. Or yeah. Yeah. yeah, he yeah. he got yeah. the ten million at nine a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He got that ten million at nine a.m. I, I do like the seeing like the group of ten dudes. Well, I mean, I didn't like seeing it at the time because <laughs> at the end at the end of the fucking sh- the ship when they're done with their one Grey Goose bottle, everybody pulls out their credit card. Yeah, yeah. split it. That was yeah, the yeah splitting problem. it like but ten those ways. Are the nine to fivers. Those are the those guys are the nine to fivers that working. Yeah. You know what I mean? They worked all week to go to the, the club for their yeah. one bottle of Grey Goose. That one of them is like a VP at Dean Witter, like just busting his ass. And the rest of them are just like, oh, my boys at Dean. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I can't even imagine, though. Like back in the day, you know, you got that job. You're at the bar. You're buying pitchers and shots and you're good for a while. Right now yeah. you got one night every couple months. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, yo, one night, you're saving up for that night. You got to make that shit happen, and then you're stuck with your boys at the end of the night anyway. Oh, man. And then, you there's, know? And then there's people, like, and they're all dressed up, and there's people like us in the club who just show up every night in Scumbags. sweatpants and a hoodie <laughs> and drink for free at the bar and be like, idiots. Oh, my God. <laughs> I remember leaving 14 drenched from champagne. Oh, yeah. My white shirt is now yellow. Yeah. And, like, the, the collar's hanging low from people pulling on it, and I just walk into the club past all these people who are, like, <laughs> dressed from to the nines. I smell like shit, just like... Let me in, motherfucker. Yo, what am I? I have a story like that. Speaking of 11, yeah. I was at 11 for WMC and we get there and they're like, I think Chainsmokers oh, yeah, yeah. or somebody. Uh, uh, no, g Easy was performing. Yeah. So like there's 300 people outside of this club and I was with Lauren and some of the other girls yeah. and we get there and we call up one of the guys, you know, one of the higher ups there and there's like 300 people outside. They're not letting anybody in. I'm in sweatpants, a hoodie, a fucking Nike starter jacket and a pair and a pair of flip flops. They move the crowd out. One of the hosts comes, pulls me and the three girls in. I got my hood up, my hat down, and people start taking pictures of me because they think I'm G-Easy now at this point because <laughs> they're not letting people in the club. But yet, because we're all part of this industry family, they literally walk me in <laughs> right. to the hottest club in the probably in the world on Saturday night of the bit prime time of the year yeah, yeah, yeah. but like that's what it's like for and then you have all those people that are spending all of <laughs> I was about money. to say you you had like a rapper outfit on yeah, yeah, exactly. right, 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 starter outfit. jackets of, look at that shit that shit's hot the old starter jacket with the flip flops shit fuck with me and get some money yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just funny like that we can do I mean bro how many times have we talked about going to Greystone back in the day and we wouldn't walk in through the front we'd walk in through the back on like some good fella shit right and people would be like who are these guys I'm like yeah. yo trust me I'm nobody special yeah yeah. I'm nobody special they got Chris Paul waiting in the front but yeah, I get to walk in through the back. I mean, that was the that was the plus, right? That was the plus of the, all the dues that we paid, all the vomit that we sweeped up, all that, yeah. all that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it took us a long time to plus. get to there. It does, it does, it does. A lot of times, but you know, those are those are good times, and we gotta appreciate that shit because a lot of people save up for months and months to just to be there it. that one night. You know, because yes. that shit is expensive, bro. I mean, I look at the at the festival circuit. Like, people save up for a whole year sure. to go to Coachella. Sure. And I decide the morning of, and then I have an artist wristband, and I'm sitting in the front. Yeah. Of, like, yeah. It's crazy. It's people crazy. Just, like, plan out, and our lives are just definitely a whole different reality. Yeah, man. Even when I just go home back to New Orleans and I order a round of drinks, and, and they're like, they're like twenty bucks for ten drinks. I'm like, wait, wait. Yeah, right. The best. <laughs> it's amazing. It's the best. I just ordered ten drinks. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Not in LA anymore. Fucking you feel fifteen dollars like a, a drink. You feel like a baller. Oh yeah, you're like, give me, give me another round. You're fucking, yeah, I'm buying. Next, you know, you everybody. spent the all the money that you would have spent in LA, but because you just don't fucking know how to control yourself at this point. Donnie <laughs> Homes comes up. <laughs> oh man, yo, I feel like we need to bring you back. I'm down anytime. Oh man, 
and I'll, I'll, I'm actually interested to see when you go back to like full service again, okay. yeah. uh, how everything changes. I think that I think people yeah. want to hear that. I think we might be due for a Roaring Twenties. I don't know. Everybody's saying that, right? You know? Right. Um, we'll see. You know, it's going to look different though. But I mean, already, you know, I mean, it's happening. People are going to go nuts. Hopefully, yeah. I hope. I think so. I'm ready. I mean, I think we paid again. We paid, paid some dues. dues. Yeah. You know, I think like I'm ready. I'm yeah. ready for that to happen. You know, I'm ready to get carried up that steep ass ramp you got in the back. I got you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it soon, yo, Dylan. Thank you so much thank for you being for on the show, man. You it was, was a great. real pleasure. Great time, man. Great times. Yeah, we'll see you next time on the Chaos. All right, peace. Thanks. Peace. Man. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Chaos Control, hosted by Mikey Tableman and Danny J Gomez, producer and audio engineer Nick Dewar. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Join us next week for more Chaos.